Oof. This is one of those Sundays when I want to put a warning on the door, just so you know. <laughs> it's a rough text, y'all. But let me begin here. One of my favorite poems is by the poet and mystic Hafiz, and it's called Every City is a Dulcimer. At the end of the poem, Hafiz writes, Birds initially had no desire to fly. What really happened was this. God once sat close to them playing music. When he left, they missed him so much, their great longing sprouted wings, needing to search the sky. Listen, Hafiz knows, nothing evolves us like love. I love that it is love and longing that causes birds to sprout wings. And I wonder then, what about people? What has changed in us because love has come down among us? We too have a great longing for this love, for a, a deep mutuality and expansive graciousness wrapped up in the vulnerability that is self-giving love. At its very best, marriage is one human answer to this deep longing, a vocational call that is a mirror, although admittedly a dim one, for the love of God for humankind. Dearly beloved, when we gather on the occasion of a wedding, we claim that we gather in celebration of love. This day, we believe, is pivotal in the life of the couple. And we create rituals that are meant to be expressions of this couple's unique love and intimacy. We, as a culture, have fallen head over heels for this idea of romantic love and set as an idea the passion felt in early love. Unfortunately, this love cools. And our culture offers us few tools to face the endless obligation of family life. In the end, what we claim to celebrate is something that is simply not meant to last. Romantic love and passionate intimacy faces challenges when it comes up against the brokenness that we bring to every relationship. When the highlight of our evening is filing our nails while binge-watching Netflix, or when we're just simply too exhausted from our day-to-day -day lives, what will fill the longing for love and grace and mutuality? Struggling with this institution is not a new human endeavor. Jesus is asked to field a few questions, mostly about one of the two possible endings of marriage, divorce. You will note that the question drips with a patriarchal understanding of marriage. Not only does it, does it assume a husband and a wife, but it assumes a very lopsided power dynamic. It assumes that marriage exists for the pleasure of the husband. Now, among Romans, women could bring a marriage to an end, but there were different words for when men or women petitioned for divorce. In Jesus' time, among Jews, it was unlawful for a woman to initiate divorce, though some did. And men needed few reasons for divorce. The passage the Pharisees refer to and in it, Moses permitted a man to divorce his wife if there was, and I quote, something objectionable about her. Furthermore, among Jews and Romans, only a woman could commit adultery against her husband. A man's philandering was of no consequence. The end of marriage in the ancient world showcases relationships devoid of mutual affection, of devoid of wild forgiveness born out of vulnerability, of grace made cheap by claiming only a few worthy of it. But as we read today, Jesus includes the women. 
He includes the possibility of their petitioning for a divorce, of their feelings, of their forgiveness. That Jesus includes women, that he uses the same language for their desires to bring a marriage to end, says something about the purpose of marriage. Rather than being about passion or one partner's satisfaction, Jesus refers his listeners to a different part of the Torah, a different part of God's law, not to Moses' permission to divorce, but to Genesis, to the idea that in marriage, spouses become one flesh, a deep and hopefully sustaining intimacy. The marker of marriage then is not the status and pleasure of one spouse or the other, but about the mutuality shared among them. At its very best, marriage points beyond itself to God's goals for all of humanity. Two people equal in belovedness live toward one another as Christ lives toward us. We are given not just to our spouse, but we're given to all of humanity. We are given to partnership because as God says, it is not right that we should be alone. I think it is this deep longing for enfleshment, for this kind of intimacy that has caused so many of us to fight for the right not just to love, but to be joined to our partners. It's not just the fight for interracial marriage or gay marriage, for anything that doesn't look like some false idea of man and woman, a fight not for passion, but for mutuality, for the kind of equality that welcomes children as royalty the kind of equality that caused Paul to pin, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, no longer slave nor free, no longer male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. That marriage is a longing, then, tells us that we are not given in marriage, but that we are called into it by virtue of our baptisms. At its God-inspired ideal, marriage conveys to each partner a measure of God's grace, the very grace lavished upon us in our baptism and which sustains us throughout our lives. Baptism is about who we are in Christ as complete and full human beings. It isn't just who we are in our holiness, but who we are in our becoming. Emerging from the water, we are called into life. We are called into vocation. Baptismal vocation, borrowing Frederick Buechner's famous definition, is where the world's great need and our deep longing meet. It isn't just our careers, but our meaningful volunteer work. This morning, we will welcome several of our young people into a journey that the church calls confirmation. This, too, is a baptismal vocation to deepen our relationship with God and neighbor through greater understanding of scripture and the sacraments. Vocation is so much more, too. It's being a student, becoming a parent, caring for our own aging parents, singleness, and marriage. The world's deep longing is for community and mutuality. Our longing to experience God's love will in time call many of us into marriage. But let us speak the truth, beloved. We are not all called into this vocation, and sometimes some of us are called from this vocation. All marriages, after all, will come to an end, and this end is never easy. There are just two ways that marriages end, divorce or death. What does it mean about the institution of marriage if we know that it is destined to end? I think this is where the language of call matters most. When Pastor Leisha and I were talking about this text this week, she gave me such a helpful frame for understanding this. She said, some calls are for a lifetime and some are for a season. This frees us from the idea that what is broken is always a failure. 
Many of the people who have permitted me to walk beside them during their divorce have noted that the major turning point in the dissolution of their marriages was when they were able to embrace their new vocation as single and to look with hope to what this could mean for all of their relationships and for their life. If we understand marriage as a vocation to which we are called because we are baptized, because we are the beloved of God, then we can also consider death and divorce not to be the end of love or mutuality or the sharing of God's grace among us, but merely the door through which we might find new expressions of mutuality and grace and love. Merely a new avenue for finding and growing the kingdom of God. Beloved, in the end, it isn't our goal as Christians to be the best at marriage. I would actually expect to see equitable divorce rates among Christians as non-Christians, really. The truth is, our brokenness makes mutuality and equality and daily forgiveness and self-giving love a particularly difficult endeavor. We're not better at this. We just try to be honest about how hard this vocation is. We see marriage in all its stages and all its forms, beginnings and endings, as a lens through which we better understand and incorporate God's grace into our lives. Not that it is never broken or ended among us, but that even its brokenness finds an opportunity for us to do the things we long to do, to live together and to set one another free and to participate in God's mending of the universe. Amen.